So a very big welcome to you in this module, Ego and Happiness. Uh, congratulations on pushing this far forward into the course. By now, hopefully you've worked with all the exercises or you are working with the exercises as you begin to pay attention to your emotions, be curious around them. Get to know your base fears a little um, as you start also noticing how our inner thoughts, our inner voices can stimulate our emotions and our fears and how these reoccur again and again and you know, become our core beliefs that can also lead us into those unhealthy ego behaviors which create the drama game around us. And yes, hopefully you've been working with the exercises from the drama game, noticing more where it does happen in your life. And if you can, to whoop yourself out of the drama game which does lead to a healthier state of well-being in the long run. Now in this module, I would like to explore the relationship between ego and happiness and why we get it wrong. And we'll also look at why we make comparisons, which undermines our well-being. In this specific topic and the next, I would like to explore the following. What is the relationship between ego and happiness? More specifically, why and how does the ego want us to be happy? And we will also look at what goes wrong if we allow our ego to make the choices for us in terms of our happiness. You will recall that the ego creates a whole series of coping mechanisms around our base fears. These coping mechanisms are our identity, which includes our strengths and weaknesses that make up our personality. You'll also recall when it comes to our base fears and pain, the ego will do what it can to steer us away from that pain and towards pleasure. And it will do this by influencing our behavior accordingly, which may ultimately land us on the rocks. What we run from, we run towards. But what about happiness? Why does our ego want control over our happiness if we are not consciously taking charge of our own well-being? The ego is more concerned about avoiding our fears and pains, and its search for happiness is part of this coping mechanism around these fears and pains. The ego is not so concerned about our long-term well-being. Rather, it is focused on the short term, so it drives us towards these pleasure-seeking activities to numb the pain and to mask the fears through instant gratification. For this reason, I feel the ego version of happiness is not strictly what I would call long-term well-being, but rather a state of continuous short-term pleasures. As you will discover, this is not sustainable and ultimately makes us unhappier in the long run. What we run from, we run towards. So how does the ego influence our behavior? Well, the ego unchecked will subconsciously urge us continuously towards those dopamine rushes by convincing us through our thoughts, our beliefs, and our emotions that these activities will make us happier for a longer time than they really do. So let's look at an example. Mike notices that his friends seem to be making more money than him. It is reflected in the cars they drive and the lifestyles they seem to live from Mike's perspective. This reinforces his feelings of inadequacy and low self-worth, and to add to this, he is feeling lonely as he does not have a partner in his life. He thinks to himself, I will be much happier when I get a promotion, and with that salary increase, I can have that quality of life my friends have. I can buy a decent looking car, maybe get a bigger house, and that will also maybe attract that perfect looking someone into my life. This is the ego using his thoughts, beliefs, and emotions to convince him that happiness is found out there through his ladder of inference. The ego convinces Mike that his happiness lies in the hands of that promotion, that expensive car, that large house, that perfect looking partner. But is this going to provide Mike with long-term happiness if he is using these to cover up his fears? You see, the ego will make choices for us to fill these voids, these base fears we want to avoid, and we make the mistake of confusing this avoidance with happiness. What we are really doing is numbing the pain and providing a short-term solution to our fears, which cannot serve us in the longer term. Mike gets that promotion, he gets that salary increase, and the first thing he does is buy that expensive car and gets that bigger house using debt to help because it speeds up the process. And finally, he attracts that perfect looking partner, which makes him look particularly good in his fast car. For that first year, he is elated and feeling great about himself. The car, the house, the awesome stuff he bought, and that perfect partner boosts his sense of self-worth, improves his confidence, and makes him feel less lonely. Also, his friends are seeming to be paying more attention to him because of this new lifestyle he has. But let's fast forward to one and a half years later. 
Mark is now not so excited about his car. That brand new leathery smell of the new car is gone and well, it's just not making him feel as happy anymore. Besides, his friends have upgraded their cars. He is now eyeing the latest model that is available, but he is in too much debt to buy a new car and <sighs> feels depressed because of the burden of this debt, which has now outweighed the pleasure he had when he first got the car. His house expenses have increased since it's a bigger home, which means he can hardly go on holiday and feels quite trapped. He also finds that this partner that he chose is not so perfect, and he's actually quite bored because they have nothing in common. You know, maybe you should leave her and find someone else who is better. He wishes he could find a better job with more money so he can worry less. Mike is feeling unhappy and his inadequacy and self-worth is showing up again along with this feeling that there is a loss of control in his life where things are just not working out as he originally expected. Now this is not about whether money can buy happiness or not. This is about being mindful of the choices we make on what we think will make us happier and why we are making those choices. Are they to mask or hide a base fear or to numb the pain? The ego can convince us that we'll be much happier when we have the awesome stuff, that great job, that perfect partner, when it is really looking to the external world to hide our fears and to boost our pleasure so as to numb the pain. So in the next topic, we will continue with ego and happiness part two, where I connect some dots between ego, attachment, identity, and happiness. And as we finish off this topic, I leave you with a wonderful quote by Eckhart Tolle. The ego's form of happiness can't exist without unhappiness. The ego will be happy when something good happens, but unhappy when it ends. So I will see you in the next topic, and until then, take care and stay aware.